Really appreciate the uh, special music. We always appreciate hearing uh, from uh, from that, uh, from our choir, and as well as uh, other special music from time to time. One of the last times that I spoke to you here, I addressed a subject in Matthew chapter 24 of three categories of warning that Christ delivered uh, to his disciples. Uh, in Matthew chapter 24, in uh, verse 8, after he had cataloged various things that were going to happen in the end time, and he talked about uh, false prophets, and he talked about wars and rumors of wars, and he talked about uh, the famines and the disease epidemics, uh, the various things. He said in verse 8, all these are the beginnings of sorrows. And then in verse 9, he said, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So he talked about a time of, an, uh, a time of great animosity toward the people of God. Now, brethren, before you can be hated of all nations for the name of Christ, before you can be hated for the truth of God, you must first be known, and you must be known for the truth of God. So, this verse in itself stands to show that there is going to come to a public awareness all over this world of the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God, and there will be a time in the future of persecution that will be launched, the people of God. Now notice what Christ said in verse 10, Then shall many be offended then, in a time of persecution, in a time of difficulty, in a time of adversity, a time of great pressure. He said, Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. So he talked about a time when many would be offended. People would become resentful. Uh, people would uh, actually allow animosities to come to the, to the fore. So Christ is speaking here to his disciples, and I think it's important to understand in Matthew 24 that the whole context is the disciples came to him privately off on the Mount of Olives and asked him some questions about what would set the stage for his return as the Messiah, his appearance as the Messiah in power and glory, and the bringing in, the ushering in of a new age. And all that Christ said in Matthew 24, was pre all of these comments were predicated upon the question that had been asked. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of this age? So Christ warned them. Speaking here, warning his disciples, warning God's people, that there would come a time when many would be offended. And then in verse 11, he talked about that many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. So we find that many will be offended, many will be deceived, and in verse 12, because iniquity shall abound. Iniquity, the word uh, here literally, uh, means lawlessness, you know, anomia. Uh, nomos is the Greek word for law, iniquity, because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So we find that many will be offended, many will be deceived, and many will simply grow lukewarm, grow sort of cold and indifferent because of the, certainly the lawlessness of the society and a lack of focus on God's law. Because real love is not just a feeling or an emotion, real love flows through the channel of God's law. You know, love is the fulfilling of the law. God explains that to us. Then we're told in verse 13 that he that shall endure, he that shall uh, abide, that shall remain steadfast unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, I went into each of these three categories, and I don't propose to do that today, but I want to focus our attention on one specific one that... I think a little more attention needs to be given to, and that is in verse 10, when it talks about many shall be offended. The word offended, or the word offend, means to stumble. To offend means to cause to stumble. And God, throughout the Scriptures, draws the analogy of the Christian life being a pathway. That we follow a way of life, a path of life. And there are things that cause people to stumble as they walk that pathway. Now, if Christ takes the time to warn us that something is going to be a problem, the reason, the whole reason you give a warning 
is to keep someone that you love and care about from being hurt or being uh, some way damaged. When a severe weather warning comes on the news, uh, on the television or on the radio, the purpose is to keep people from getting hurt. Back a couple of years ago when we had the hurricane that came through and the warnings were given, uh, the reason the warnings were given was to save lives, to prevent people from being uh, hurt and, and problems from, from resulting that way. So Christ gave warnings. And these warnings are important, and they're warnings that, to which we, as the people of God, must take heed. You know, he says that many will be offended. How? Why will that be the case? You know, wouldn't it seem, now just think about it for a second, wouldn't it seem that when all of these events begin to transpire and as all of these things are happening and the events are building and building up to the final events as a prelude to Christ's return, people looking at it would think, well, boy, you know, when I see all those things happen and know that the return of Christ is near, I'm going to be on best behavior. That will be the least time that I would be offended or be deceived or get lukewarm. Oh no, I'd be stirred up and zealous and full of love and faith and, and I'd really be stirred up because I would know that Christ's coming is near. Brethren, we have seen, we have seen in, in recent years incredible things happen, things that many of us in this room had heard about and had read about way back the 60s and in the 50s and even before. You know, it's interesting when the events that culminated in the unification of Germany that culminated in some of these things, and events are going on all over the world. I don't know how many of you read carefully the, or, or even saw the article in Newsweek ma or in U.S. News and World Report magazine just a matter of, of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was there. It was an article that focused in uh, on, of all things, as the cover article focused in on the second coming of Christ. Now, you know that's quite a that's quite a remarkable thing for U.S. News and World Report to feature. Uh, but they had an article on the subject, and they had interviewed people, and they had taken opinion polls, and found out that the majority of people in this in this country believe that Christ is going to return, and that it's not way off in the distant future. Now, they don't understand a lot of things about it, and a lot of uh, false ideas and misunderstanding comes in. But there are many people who understand and realize that something is going on. And they see these things. One interesting point that U.S. News made in there, they uh, focused in on what was happening in other places. And I don't know if you noticed the little blurb they had in there uh, concerning Israel and a group called the Temple Mount Faithful. And the fact that uh, they even reported uh, an incident that I think I'd mentioned to some in Bible study, uh, but they even reported the fact that the that in the last uh, oh I guess a year or so uh, that uh, there has even been uh, a special agreement uh, that had been worked out involving the importation of cattle uh, to Israel. You know, one of the things that is necessary before the rebuilding of a temple, the rededication of an altar, one of the things that is necessary is you've got to have uh, animals to sacrifice and you also have to have uh, specifically, as it uh, describes back in the books of the law, what were called the waters of purification, which was necessary uh, to make everything ceremonially clean. And that involved, uh, the. you can go back and read the details in the book of Numbers, but it involved the, the ashes of a red heifer. Uh, a red heifer that was uh, slaughtered uh, and whose a that was burned totally uh, together with uh, hyssop and cedar wood and scarlet cloth until nothing but ashes remained and then the ashes of the heifer were mixed in with water and this was the water of purification. You can read the, the details that are given. But uh, even U.S. News reported the, uh, uh, the fact of, of the agreement that had been worked out and, and a, uh, a red Angus breeder in Mississippi uh, who had actually sold the cattle uh, to uh, uh, this uh, rabbinic uh, school uh, there in Israel. Because, you see, they, had, they needed uh, cattle that met the exact specifications. And one of the, the problems that they had was that the cattle they used had to be without blemish. Uh, 
Well, any cattle that are exported out of the United States have to be tattooed and, and they're tattooed in the ear and they've got their shots and all of this. Well, they couldn't use anything like that over there. That, had, that was a blemish. So actually what they did was he bred, uh, he bred cattle uh, in uh, Mississippi and he shipped them over there so that the calves would be born in Israel. Uh, and that uh, then uh, they would, uh, that the calves would be uh, out of the calves that were born, uh, those that were unblemished would be uh, selected out and they would begin a herd uh, there. And they're in the process of, of importing uh, cattle uh, from him. And, and now this is U.S. News Moral Report magazine. This isn't some uh, exotic source off, uh, you, you know, some uh, clandestine source. This isn't some, uh, this isn't something out of the National Enquirer. You know, these are things that, that here a, a major news magazine in the United States, a conservative type magazine, is discussing issues such as this. And it's very interesting. They interviewed the rabbis over there about how they proposed to the, the, the rebuild the temple. And they said, well, we don't know. But what we're convinced of is if we are ready, if we are ready, then, you know, God will work out the details of how to get started. He says, it's our responsibility to get ready. And so they have uh, put together everything from a computer database that has all of the, uh, descend uh, all of the descendants of Aaron that they can uh, locate uh, so that they have the basis of, uh, uh, you know, lining up a priesthood. They've got the schools going. They're making the implements. They're doing all the things that they know to do to get ready. And just one other sort of a sideline, this really isn't, the, this is sort of a sideline, but I thought it was interesting. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that sort of ties in with this, an article in Biblical Archaeology Review back, uh, uh, this has been a number of months ago, but after extensive studies over there, you know, one of the things that has always been the issue has been how would they build, a, rebuild a temple on the Temple Mount because that's where the Dome of the Rock is. And, and the temple would have to be relocated where it was. Well, after some extensive uh, archaeological excavations that were done under the Temple Mount, these have been put a stop to now because it uh, just about created a riot, but uh, one of the things that they had, they had discovered uh, were some places from which they could measure, some, some corners uh, of wall uh, that they were able to, uh, uh, on a foundations, that they could measure from to actually get, to, using a, a computer model of the Temple Mount, they have the measurements given in the Bible, and by locating the a couple of specific points, they could lay the whole thing out. And what they have come to the conclusion of, there had been debate for a long time, but now, as far as I know, all of the rabbis and all of the, the archaeological uh, people there in Israel are convinced that the the Holy of Holies did not, is not right where the uh, Dome of the Rock is. It was adjacent to it. That the Dome of the Rock actually sits, uh, interestingly enough, in what was anciently the court of the Gentiles. Uh, and uh, in fact, that, that sort of makes, uh, that, that gives a little more meaning to the, to the verse back in uh, Revelation 11 where it talks about measure the temple. But the court of the Gen uh, but the, 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 the court that is outside, uh, leave out, that is given to the Gentiles. Uh, it's sort of interesting because uh, when, you, when you put it together, there may be, I'm not saying there's not a spiritual implication to that, uh, but, uh, you know, often things can have both a physical and a spiritual implication. But uh, the point is, it uh, um, talks about measuring the temple and the altar and those that worship there in the court, which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, it's given unto the Gentiles. Uh, this is in Revelation 11 too. Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you keep watch on the fact of, of the attempt to broker a peace in Israel and in the Middle East and realize Jerusalem is and always has been the bone of contention about which the Jews and the Arabs never can agree. And you keep watch on what's going to happen and to what extent is the door going to be opened up. I don't know the specifics of how it's going to be worked out, but I do know this, that... Things are shaping up. Now, there have been a tremendous amount of things that have occurred and that have shaped up in the last few years. 
And I think most of us uh, don't have to think that far back. Remember uh, there at the uh, Feast of Tabernacles during the feast in 1989 uh, as the uh, Berlin Wall was breached uh, and as literally we came to a pivot point in history. The history of the post-World War II era totally changed because up until that time from for really a period of uh, 40 years, uh, there had been an iron curtain. There had been uh, a cold war in progress. And at that point, within a matter of weeks, the cold war was simply a matter of history. And the entire face of Europe had changed and the stage was being set. The stage was being set for the emergence of the final uh, superpower the final United States of Europe, the final resurrection of the old Roman Empire. And uh, so many of these things are going on. Brethren, as things happen, as things go on in the world around us, that's no guarantee that we're not going to fall in the category of being offended or being deceived or just becoming lukewarm and indifferent and all the zeal going out. I love growing cold. Don't, let's not ever kid ourselves that just because we look and this is happening and that's happening, oh, that means nothing will happen to me because I'm going to really be on fire. You know, nobody is, is ready to put their name on a sign-up list that uh, want to volunteer. You know, how many of you would like to volunteer to be offended and to hate one another? You know, we've got a list over here. You can all sign that. Uh, or or uh, how many of you want to volunteer to be deceived? Everybody wants to be deceived, you know. Or everybody that wants their love to grow cold. Well, you can put that list out anywhere, and I don't think you'd get any signers. You know, I don't, think, I don't think you'd get any signers. Nobody wants to volunteer for something like that, and yet Christ said it would happen to many people. It happened to many. He didn't say maybe one or two. Now, what is this about being offended? What is it that causes people to be offended? You know, wouldn't it be a terrible thing to, to be in that category? Well, you know, we don't have to be. God hasn't predetermined any of us and say, you're going to get offended, and I'm going to make sure you're offended, and, and, and you're the one that's going to be offended. No, God, hasn't, God hasn't assigned any of us to that category, though our actions and our choices will hold the key as to whether we assign ourselves. Now, let's understand a little bit of, of why people get offended, why many will be offended. Here in Matthew 24, it specifically speaks in the context of a time when a lot of trouble is going on, when the going gets rough, when the pressure is on. In Matthew 26 and verse 30, we read here of the conclusion of the Passover service, Christ's final Passover with the disciples. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said unto them, All of you shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I'll smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered together. Now notice in verse 33, notice what Peter said. Peter answered and said, Lord, though all men be offended because of you, I will never be offended. Don't lock me in with that. That'll never happen to me. I'll never be offended because of you. Boy, you can count on me. You know, Christ told him, he said, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me three times. Well, Peter didn't believe that. Peter said, no, it doesn't matter. I'll die with you, but I won't deny you. And then all the others piped in and said, me too. We'll never do a thing like that. And you know what, brethren? At that moment, they didn't think they would. At that moment, none of them thought they would. That's the last thing. Peter ever imagined himself doing, and it's the last thing any of them, they thought, well, I wouldn't do something like that. Well, you know the story. Christ came there to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he took Peter and James and John, 
mentions in verse 37, took them apart. And he went even apart from them to, to pray, and he asked them to wait there and pray with him. And in verse 40, when he came back, he found them asleep. And he said, can't you fellows watch just for an hour? Can't you be alert just for an hour? You know, watch and pray, verse 41, that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, here's the problem. It wasn't that Peter didn't mean it when he said, oh, I won't ever be offended. Oh, it's not that Peter didn't mean it. It's not that Peter didn't mean, I will never let you down. He, oh, he meant it when he said it. Christ told him, he said, the Spirit is willing. You know, you really mean that, Peter, but the flesh is weak. You're relying on your strength. And your strength in a crisis will crumble. Your faith, your strength, your human strength isn't enough to get you through. So watch and pray. Well, he went aside and he prayed the second time. When he came again, he found them asleep. Their eyes were heavy. In verse 44, he left and went away and prayed again third time, saying the same words. And then he came to his disciples and he said unto them, Well, you might as well go on and get your rest because uh, now the time is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed. And, and, you know, then they began to sort of look up and try to figure out what was going on. And he said, Come on, let's get going. And as they came back there, you know the story. The soldiers came in and Christ was taken. And in verse uh, 56, the latter part of the verse, we read, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. When the going got tough, they got scared. Now, you know the difference? They were confronting an intense horrible crisis. But they were confronting it on their own strength. They didn't recognize the insufficiency of their strength to see them through. Well, he says, you'll, you'll be offended. You'll stumble. You will, you'll run like, you'll scatter like a covey of quail. When all the soldiers showed up and the, and the torches blazing and the spears uh, being held and the swords there and all of the, the confusion and all of the things and here he was taken and, and what was happening now? now? Peter had drawn his sword out. He was ready to fight and then Christ, uh, he, uh, all he managed to do was hack the guy's ear off and Christ picked it up and put it back on. Told him, he said, Peter, <laughs> what's this sword going to do? You know, here they are surrounded. By, by scores of soldiers with weapons. And Peter's got his little sword there. I, well, this is really going to accomplish something. Christ told him, he said, Peter, he says, you know, I could ask my father, and he'd send 12 legions of angels. He that lives by the sword dies by the sword. You put your trust in that thing, and you're going to be laying on the ground dead. Those fellows will make short work of you. You think I'm powerless? You think that I, I have to depend on you and your sword? You think that's the best that I can do? And to demonstrate that power, he picked up the ear and put it back on, and here the guy was healed. Christ wasn't taken because he was powerless. Well, the disciples were scared and they were frustrated, and all of a sudden they thought they were all about to be taken, and they, they split. They got out of there. Christ had talked to them earlier that evening. It's recorded back in John 14 and 15. And as he concludes the words that he said to them there that evening in, on the Passover, we read in John 16, 1, that these words have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. Well, they'll put you out of the synagogue. Yes, the time comes that whoever kills you will think that he does God a service. These things will they do unto you because they've not known the Father nor me. See, Christ had taken them through and he had talked about things. They didn't fully get the point when he was talking about it because he wasn't just concerned about that evening. He was concerned about on in the future. They were going to be in a time of intense pressure. 
They were going to be living through some times of intense pressure. And what were they going to do? How were they going to handle it? Well, brethren, if we depend on our own strength, our strength will fail in a crunch. There is none of us that has the strength in and of ourselves to make it through all the things that lie ahead. When the going gets tough, we need more than ever, the strength and the power of God to be able to endure, to be able to persevere. Jesus Christ spent hours in prayer that evening, wrestling through the point of totally turning it over to God and putting it in the Father's hands. He said, uh, you, you remember the story as he started out his prayer and he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Everything within him, from the human standpoint, rebelled at the thought of all the horror that he was going to have to go through. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he wrestled in agony there in the garden to absolutely, totally, unconditionally put the whole situation in the hands of God the Father and say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And when he ended up, there was a positive confidence that he had. He says, come on, let's go. He was ready to meet and to face what lay before him. But the disciples weren't. Because you see, the reality of what lay before them didn't really sink in. It wasn't really real to them. Oh, they probably mumbled a little bit of a prayer. But they were tired, it was late, they were sleepy, they had had a big meal, and they just, you know, about five minutes, they felt like they pretty well covered everything that needed to be covered, and they dozed off. They did not recognize their lack of self-sufficiency. They did not recognize their own weakness for what it was. They overestimated their own strength. That's a dangerous thing for us to overestimate our own strength. You see, if we don't rely on God's strength, when we start relying on our strength, we're in trouble. Because our strength has a breaking point. Our strength has a bending point. Our strength is insufficient. I don't care how strong you are. You're not strong enough. Neither am I. The only source of strength that will never fail us is the strength that comes from God. God's strength will never fail in the crunch. Oh, you go through. Peter learned that lesson and he learned it deeply and he never, ever forgot it. You go through the book of Acts and you read the things that he went through and the boldness that he had. Peter learned how to face the pressure because you see, Peter didn't depend on his own strength again. He learned a bitter lesson that night. He did what he thought. He would never under any circumstances do. Christ allowed that to happen because that was a crucial lesson to be learned. You know, in Matthew chapter 13, one of the parables Christ gives is the parable of the sower and the seed. And he starts out, we start out in chapter 13 talking about the sower and the seed. And remember, the sower went out and he sowed the seed and some of it fell by the wayside. The birds gathered, uh, the birds ate it up and some of it fell on stony ground and, and it uh, germinated quickly and came up quickly. But then when the sun got hot and the weather got dry, uh, it withered because it had no depth of root. And some fell uh, in an area where there were a lot of weeds and thorns. And it came up, but it never was productive. It was just choked out. And some of it fell on good ground, and it came up and was very productive. Then Christ went through to explain this parable on in the latter part, to the mid-portion of the chapter. And he said, in verse 19, we'll pick it up of Matthew 13, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. 
He that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that hears the word, and anon with joy receives it. Oh, he hears it and he's excited and he's, he's learned the truth and he's all stirred up about it. Verse 21, yet has he not root in himself? He has not root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he's offended. Now, here's talking about tribulation or persecution. The word tribulation is an interesting word in, in the Greek language because it's derived from a word that means pressure. It's derived from the same word that uh, we get that the word for wine press. That's what it's talking about. You know, you, you know what happens with a wine press. You fill it up with grapes and start turning the screw, you know, tightening it down. And finally squeezes all the juice out. And sometimes we feel like, you know, that's what's happening to us. Somebody's tightening down the screw and all the juice is getting squeezed out. And that's not a very pleasant feeling. So he talks about, in verse 21 of Matthew 13, two things. Tribulation or persecution. See, tribulation just means the intense pressure. The intense pressure that comes on. And persecution, of course, is, uh, is, as we all understand, that, that is outright uh, opposition and, and animosity and enmity. It can come uh, in uh, direct ways or a little more uh, less obvious ways. You know, sometimes you can be persecuted in a, uh, in a more subtle way and sometimes in a very direct way, as God's people have been from time to time down through, time, uh, through history. But the point is, what happens here? What's this category? It's the category that did not have a good root system. They were not well rooted. They lasted for a while. They started out quickly and they lasted for a while. But when the pressure got on and when the trouble and the, the opposition, the persecution began to build up, they withered. They were offended. You see, pressure is what causes many to be offended. We're warned about that. We're warned that many will be offended when the pressure is on. That's the specific thing that Christ mentioned in Matthew 24, that the time when many will be offended will culminate when the pressure is really brought to bear. You know, when we're under a lot of stress and pressure, it brings out certain things. And this happens on the physical level. I think we all know when a disaster strikes, uh, for some it brings out their best and for others it brings out their worst. You know, some take advantage of the opportunity to go out and loot and, and try to steal something that they think they can get by with in a time of crisis when everything is breaking down and others uh, will just literally seemingly work the clock around trying to help or trying to serve volunteering their time. Pressure puts a stress factor in our lives and any of the flaws that run through our character are, let's say, made more clearly manifest, the more pressure, the more stress that's there. Many will be offended because of the pressures, because of the stress. What do we see here? What, what do we derive from these lessons? Because none of us want to be offended when we're under those pressures. None of us want to crack. None of us want to stumble in the way when the pressure is on. How can we prevent it? Well, we're told right here in Matthew 13, the problem as to why these people are offended when the pressure is on is because they're not deeply rooted. Your roots have to run deep. You've got to know and know that you know. You've got to be deeply anchored in the truth of God, the Word of God. Because if you're not, you won't endure. Sometimes the only thing that enables us to make it through is because we know and we know that we know what God says. And that's all that enables us to hang on. Because we know it. You can't turn loose of it. We've got to sink our roots down deep. And we can never afford to rely on our own strength and our own power. We must never, ever suffer the illusion 
of self-sufficiency. Because, brethren, none of us, none of us are sufficient unto ourselves. We are deeply dependent upon the power of God. And we must never lose sight of that. Pressure is a source of offense. Some will be offended when the pressure is on. Because the roots don't run deep. And they're not really relying on the power of God. Now let's look a little further. Because that's not the only thing that causes people to be offended. I think one of the chief things uh, that caused people to be offended, uh, certainly during the times when the pressure is not so intense, one of the major things that causes people to be offended is other people. You know, if you want to know who has caused offense, uh, maybe look in the mirror someday. Uh, you know, and that, that, that applies to me too, because James says in James chapter 3, James chapter 3 and verse 2, in many things we all offend. James 3, 2, in many things we offend all. If any man offends not in word, the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. If you've never said the wrong thing at the wrong time, well, you need to be explaining to the rest of us how to, <laughs> you know, you need to come on up. Because we all, if any man offend not, the same is a perfect man. If you've never offended in word, you've never said something you should. Oh, one of the great things that can cause people to stumble is other people. And when we're living in times that are relatively calm, oh, when you compare the times of pressure and the times of intensity, I know some of you are going through great pressure and intensity in your own personal lives right now, maybe because of health problems or financial problems or or family problems, or things of that sort, and we, we go through our times of intense pressure in our personal lives, but let's face it, in the world in which we live right now, it is a time of relative calm for most of us. See, we're not living over in Bosnia right now. We're not living in Haiti. We're not living in some of these areas that are nothing but a living hell. Oh, the sky is blue, and the sun is shining, and the birds are singing. And we can smell the chili cooking so we know where our next meal is coming from. It's a time of relative peace. It's a time of a lack of pressure in, the, in, in that overall sense, though as I uh, know that, that there are certainly uh, individuals who are go undergoing great uh, pressure and, and personal problems in their own lives, and we all do at one time or another. But... During these kinds of times, perhaps the most common source of offense is people. People are offended by people. And we all do something or say something at one time or another that causes somebody else to stumble. And in many things, we offend all. What do you do if you have done that? You know, we, we need to be perceptive and we need to think about and evaluate. We know that... Uh, it's not something to be taken lightly. It's not something to be taken casually and say, well, you know, we all offend. And so, you know, I, I only offended ten people a day, uh, and, and that's a pretty good day, and, and I didn't offend everybody, and so I, I don't think, you know, it's nothing to worry about. We, we should not take it in a, in a casual or careless way. We recognize that because we are all human that sometimes we just blat something out. We say something uh, in a way that... Uh, uh, maybe we didn't fully anticipate uh, the way it might come across. But you know, Christ uh, made uh, plain that uh, as to how we go about uh, some of these things and what we are to, uh, to do. Because he tells us that uh, uh, back in the Sermon on the Mount that if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has ought against you. Then, then what do you do? Well, you leave there your gift and you first go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Well, Christ brings that out and emphasizes uh, that sort of an approach uh, that we're to have. The fact that we are to take the initiative if we understand that we have hurt somebody, that we have offended someone, uh, that we 
uh, have, as it explains this here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 uh, and 24. Matthew 5, uh, 23 and 24. You know, when we come before God, and as we think back, if we are conscious that we have offended, that we have hurt, then it's we need to take the initiative to try to clear it up. Because that is something that can stand in the way of our relationship with God. So we're not to take lightly the fact that we all say and do things that sometimes inadvertently causes offense. Hopefully nobody is going to intentionally do that. But we don't perfectly bridle our tongue. But there are other ways that people offend. People cause offense. In Matthew chapter 18, we have, a, we have something that uh, brings out several different aspects of this. In Matthew chapter 18, in verse 1, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child and set him in the midst of them. And he said, except you be converted and become like this little child, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. I want to read this portion out of the New English Bible uh, because I think it gives uh, a little clearer sense uh, than uh, just a, a little more readable here. Uh, disciples asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child, set him in front of them. And said, I tell you, unless you turn around and become like children. You see, that's what the word repent means. It means to turn around. Unless you turn around and become like children, you won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let a man humble himself till he is like this child, and he will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But if a man is a cause of stumbling... To one of these little ones who have faith in me, it would be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Alas for the world that such causes of stumbling arise. Come they must, but woe betide the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot is your undoing, cut it off and fling it away. It's better to enter into life maimed or lame than to keep two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. If it's your eye that you're undoing, tear it out and fling it away. It's better to enter into life with one eye than to keep both eyes and be thrown into the fires of hell. Now, Christ obviously is talking here using something to illustrate a point that no matter how close, how important something is to you, don't let it be your undoing and the undoing of others. Don't hold on to it. Obviously, if you have a problem with stealing, cutting off your hand is not going to solve that problem. Because stealing originates in the mind. The hand merely carries out the, man, the mind's directions. The fact that you can't see is not going to prevent you from ever lusting. Because you can't tear out the eye that is in the mind. So, Christ is using an illustration here. But I want to, to call your attention, because a lot of times we read that He's talking about those who cause others to sin. Those who, whose conduct, those whose actions, whose words or actions cause others to stumble. Now, it's interesting that the opinion of the rabbis was that Jeroboam was the worst sinner. And you know why? This was their, this was their reasoning. Because every time it mentions him in the Old Testament... It always adds the phrase, he, for he caused Israel to sin. He caused Israel to sin. You know, that's the, the record that he goes down by. Uh, we just might notice a little bit back in 1 Kings 14. You remember the story of Jeroboam. He was the one that Solomon had run out uh, of town, had run out of, of Israel, and, and, and Jeroboam had been in uh, Egypt for a period of time, finally came back after Solomon's death. And Rehoboam, who took over as king, was sort of an insecure sort, and he was going to let everybody know who was in charge. And he wound up, and the whole thing erupted and blew up in his face. And Jeroboam emerged as the leader of sort of the tax protest movement of the day. 
because they were complaining about high taxes, which seems like the Israelites have been doing ever since, you know, and all down through time. Uh, that's a good uh, gimmick for a politician is to uh, claim that he's going to have, he's going to lower the taxes. Well, Jeroboam made that promise. That was his political platform. Read my lips. No new taxes. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to cut taxes. Uh, I don't know whether he did or not. He certainly made a mess of things when you go through and read uh, about Jeroboam. But he was, he was the man of the moment. And he was swept into office. The ten tribes uh, put him in as their king. And if it hadn't been for God's mercy to David, Rehoboam would have been totally out on his ear. Well, Jeroboam gets in and he's king. And the first thing he begins to do is look around and figure that when the new wears off, you know, people are going to be going down to Jerusalem every year at the feast. And they're going to be there at the temple, and Rehoboam, of course, will be there in a prominent position because, after all, he's king down there. Jeroboam thinks to himself, see, a little human reasoning. He says, you know, it's just going to be a matter of time till they get tired of me, and uh, then they're going to start looking to him. And of course, it, you know, that's the way it is. Uh, the politician comes in, and oh, he's the man of the hour, he's the savior of the people, and uh, give him a year or two, and usually people are ready to throw the bum out, and you see all these signs, don't blame me, you know, I voted for somebody else. Uh, and uh, people, you, in fact, sometimes it gets hard to find. How, how did this guy get in there? Nobody supports him. Uh, everybody's against him. They've been against him for years. Uh, well, Jeroboam was enough of a politician, he knew, see, that, that trouble was going to come up, and after a while... Uh, old Rehoboam was probably going to look pretty good to him, and then he would be out. So he came up with a plan. He said, you know what we're going to, what we need to do is stop them from going to Jerusalem. The way to do it is not forbid them, but offer them something up here. So he said, you know, we need to make religion a little more convenient. Go to Dan or Bethel. And you don't have to make that long trip to Jerusalem. And you know, the way the feast falls there in the seventh month, that's so jam up to harvest time that it sometimes really puts you in a bind to get all the crops in and be able to leave. Why don't we just move it back to the eighth month? That would be a little more convenient. So, Jeroboam introduced a couple of, quote, reforms. Now, were they really reforms? Well, it was just an attempt to make himself popular. Well, he saw that uh, he started having problems with the priesthood. You see, the Levites, the Levitical cities up there, you can see that a lot of the Levites weren't going along with him, so the thing he decided to do was get some new priests. So he began to make the lowest of the people priests and to uh, get rid of the Levites. And you can read of this, you see, as it talks about in, in uh, verse 33 of, Jer of 1 Kings 13. Uh, he returned not from his evil way, made again of the lowest of the people priests of the high places. Whosoever would, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. Anybody wanted to volunteer? Uh, you know, they couldn't find a job somewhere else. Well, they could go preach for Jeroboam. And uh, he, he would sign them up. He wanted people that would do what he paid them to do and preach what he prayed them, paid them to preach. And... This thing, we're told in verse 34, became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from the face of the earth. God took this very seriously. On over in chapter 14, here verse 16, it says that, uh, uh, in verse 15, in, in 1 Kings 14, 15, the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He'll root up Israel out of this good land which he gave to their fathers and scatter them beyond the river because they have made their groves provoking the eternal to anger. He will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who did sin and who made Israel to sin. Now, how did Jeroboam make Israel sin? Did he go around and hold a gun to everybody's head? Or a sword? They didn't have guns, but uh, they had swords, spears. Did he do that? No. He just set a bad example. And he encouraged it. You can read that there were individuals who didn't. Elijah certainly didn't go along with something like that. You can read about that a little bit later. You know, God, when Elijah really got discouraged, God said, oh, don't worry about it. He said, there's 7,000 others that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Not many out of, you know, a few million people, but uh, nevertheless, there were a few. There were a handful. No, everybody didn't do it, but the nation as a whole did. Why? Because people just tend to follow. 
And Jeroboam gave them the path of least resistance. He gave them something easy, gave them something convenient, and so they just sort of followed in. Everybody sort of fell in. And God talked about what was going to come on Israel, and it didn't actually come to pass until 200 years later. But he refers to Jeroboam, the sins of Jeroboam who did sin. That's bad. And who made Israel to sin. That's worse. You see, when it talks about if you're a cause of stumbling, when Christ talked about in Matthew, 15, in Matthew 18, if you're a cause of stumbling to one of these little ones who have faith in me, you, you'd been better off just thrown in the sea and drowned. See, to be a cause of stumbling is to be like Jeroboam, to set an example that draws others into sin. We can do that by words and actions to entice and to encourage people to get off the track and to, and to depart from God's way. That's what Jeroboam did. You can come on down a little further in chapter 15. In verse 26, it talks about Jeroboam's son. In verse 25, Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and he reigned over Israel two years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, walked in the ways of his father, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. Go on down in verse 30. Because of the sins of Jeroboam which he sinned, and which he made Israel sin, by his provocation wherewith he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. On down in verse 34. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, walked in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. Now, we could go on through... First Kings, and you find it's over and over, you know. The way of Jeroboam, and the sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. Second Kings 3, uh, it talks about Ahab. And, and um, the uh, uh, Jehoram, Ahab's son, began to reign over Israel in Samaria. In the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, this is Second Kings 3.1. And in verse 2, we're told that Jehoram wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and his mother. He was a little better than Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, because he did put away the, uh, the image of Baal. He, got rid of, he did put away the idol of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he claved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin, and he departed not therefrom. You can come all the way back here. We'll just notice one other verse back, 2 Kings 23. Way on back here, Second Kings 23. This is talking about the great reform of Josiah, when Josiah was king of Judah. And in verse 14, it talks about that he broke in pieces the images. Uh, Josiah had actually come up into the northern part, uh, which wasn't his kingdom, but he'd come up there and tore down their idols and cut their groves and uh, filled the places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel in the high place which Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made, both that altar and the high place were broken down and burned in the high place and stamped into powder and burned, burned the grove. This is Second Kings 23, 14 and 15. Over and over, every time Jeroboam's name is mentioned, Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Now, how is that for a record to go down in history? You know, every time God uh, mentions him, he says, yeah, this is the guy that, that got the whole nation off the track. Yeah, this Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he's the one that caused the whole nation to get off the track. Never got back on. The, the example of one man, the example of one leader, the king of Israel, caused the nation to sin. Now, were they responsible for what they did? Yes, they were. They were responsible. You find that there were times of revival and, and uh, there were those who left and who came down to celebrate the Passover of Hezekiah. You can read that. We won't go through it, but it's back there in Chronicles. You can read that there were individuals who responded to a man like Elijah or Elisha. There were servants of God in northern Israel, but the nation as a whole got off the track and never came back. Christ in Matthew 18 says, if a man is a cause of stumbling to one of these little ones. You know, we don't ever want to be. We don't want to have some record of us like a record of Jeroboam. Yeah, he's the one that, that uh, uh, you know, got all those people uh, messed, messed these people up and, and caused them to sin. He's the one that got them off the track. 
No. We're warned. You see, people are offended because of people. People stumble because of people. Now, sometimes we inadvertently say something that can cause offense. But then, something that is far more dangerous is when it's not so inadvertent, when through just a, an attitude of self-will, we pursue a line of endeavor, we pursue a pathway that by our words and by our actions wrongly influence others and cause them to depart from the ways of God. That's a terrible thing. And Christ warns that very, very strongly. That uh, that is something uh, on which, uh, of which we must always uh, be careful. So people are offended because of people. Back in Matthew chapter 13, let's notice another example. Matthew 13, 24. Another parable put forth he unto them. Christ gave them a parable. He said, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that sows good field, good seed in his field. And while the men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And he went his way. When the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, there then appeared the tares also. And the servants of the householder came and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in the field? Whence did the tares come? He said, well, an enemy has done this. The servant said, you want us to try to go get them all out? He said, no, lest while you gather out the tares, you root out the wheat with them. Let them both grow together unto the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, gather to gather the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them. But the wheat is to be gathered into my barn. Well, Christ went on down and he explained this as we come on down uh, a little further in verse 36, they, the disciples asked him to declare the tares, and he told them that he was the one that had sowed the good seed, uh, and the field is the world, the enemy was the devil, and that the harvest is the time of the end, when the angels will serve as, uh, are in the role of the reapers. They came to gather out and to uh, gather together those for God's spiritual harvest. Verse 40, Therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. So he's talking about a way of life. He's talking, the word, for the, the word here uh, that is translated uh, uh, all things that offend, the Greek word is scandalon. It's the word our word scandal comes from talking about those who, by scandalous conduct, cause others to stumble. Those which do iniquity, which practice the wrong way of life. You know, it's interesting. I, it makes me think of a number of years ago. This was back in, in fact, it's been 20 years ago when I first went down to Corpus Christi, Texas. And uh, there were a lot of things that were, that were transpiring at the time, and, and uh, some had... Uh, got entangled up with, with uh, a lot of different uh, problems. And I remember discussing with one individual who was upset about tithing. And he said, well, uh, you know, he, he was uh, of the opinion that uh, there was a certain individual in a high place that was uh, misusing money and was taking money and doing this and doing that and, and uh, that uh, the money was not uh, being utilized properly. This individual was... Uh, not an honest uh, person and was using, uh, skimming off uh, funds for personal profit. This was his opinion. And so we discussed it for a while, and, and this was his excuse for not tithing. And I said, well, let me ask you something. I said, what if you had lived back in the time of Christ, and you could have walked up personally to Jesus Christ and handed him personally your tithe? Would you have believed in tithing then under those circumstances? Oh, well, yeah, that would an entirely different. You know, if I could have walked up and handed it directly to Christ, well, that'd be fine. I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, what do you think Christ would have done with it? Well, I don't know. What do you, what do you mean? I said, well, what do you think Christ would have done with it? I said, I can tell you exactly what he'd done. What's that? I said, he'd have turned around and handed it to Judas. Because Judas was the keeper of the bag. 
And you know what else? Judas was a thief. Now that's not rumor. That's what it says in the book of John. That's not a rumor. I said, let me ask you something. What would you have done? Would you have been offended and said, Jesus of Nazareth cannot be the Messiah because look at this guy. He's a crook. That's the treasurer. He's a thief. The point is, of course, that Christ allowed that for a time and for a purpose. But you know, Christ was going forward and he was teaching the truth and he was doing the work of God. And the fact that Judas was in the group, that he was a tear among the wheat, did not take away from the message Christ was preaching from the truth that was going out and the work of God that was being done. And God dealt with the situation. Now the point is, people were offended because of what others said and did. There are those who have stumbled at the way and who have departed out of the way, who have abandoned everything. They were turned off and they tuned out because of what someone else said or did. It may have been simply a tear sown in among the wheat. But they stumbled in the way because of the conduct of others. Jeroboam led people off the track, but you know they had to follow. He didn't hold a sword to their head. He didn't persecute them. There's no record particularly of that. He didn't need to. All he did was set them a bad example and encourage them to follow, and pretty soon the vast majority had fallen into step. So offense can be caused, people can stumble in the way because of other people. They can be turned off because of scandal and abandon everything simply because of a tear that Satan has sown among the wheat. There are those who can follow others off the track and get tangled up in all sorts of things. Began to, to get it just like Jeroboam did. See, he didn't tell them that not to worship the true God anymore. If you go through, you find that Jeroboam continued to use the name of Yahweh, the true God of Israel. He just brought in all this other stuff and got the nation off the track. Now, if we're going to avoid stumbling at the conduct of others, we've got to be committed, we've got to be committed to what God says. We've got to see the big picture. You know, we can't have an attitude of resentment or animosity toward others. Well, Christ uh, gives, or, or uh, rather Luke records the example back in Acts chapter 7, one that we're familiar with, Stephen, the martyrdom of Stephen. Now, Stephen told the people the truth, and the truth made him mad, because that's, we're going to see the third thing that people can get offended by. People can, people can stumble when they're under pressure. People can stumble because of the words and deeds of other people. And sometimes people just simply stumble because of the truth. Now, Stephen told them the truth, and they took great offense. In fact, in, in Acts 7, uh, 54, when they heard it, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. And he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He actually saw in vision the throne of God in heaven and he actually saw. God performed a miracle and allowed Stephen to actually see that to strengthen and to encourage him at this intense time. And of course, at that point, they just put their hands in their ears and they attacked him, uh, cast him out of the city and stoned him, verse 58. In verse 59, as they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You know, Stephen offended them with the truth. 
But they didn't offend Stephen, even with their rocks. Because Stephen turned it loose. He put it in God's hands. He didn't have an attitude of resentment and retaliation. He understood what it meant to forgive. Brethren, if we're not going to be offended by people, by the things that people say and do, intentionally or unintentionally, we're going to have to exemplify the attitude of Stephen. We're going to have to exemplify the same humility and the same faith that the Syrophoenician woman exemplified in Matthew 15. She had an attitude that's greatly in contrast to the attitude that the Pharisees had, which we're going to see just a little bit later. You remember the story, Matthew 15, where the Christ had landed at the uh, uh, near the area of Tyre and Sidon, and, and uh, this is on down, uh, let's see, about verse uh, uh, 22. Uh, a Canaanitish woman uh, came out of the same coast, and she cried out, Have mercy on me, Lord, you son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a demon. And Christ didn't respond. He didn't say anything at the time. And she was continuing to come and to cry out from a distance. And the disciples uh, said, look, t tell her to leave. Tell her to go away. She's creating a disturbance. And Jesus told them, he said, I've come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I, I, this, is, this time is not the time of a ministry to the whole world. I'm here specifically to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And uh, so instead of going away, though, she came closer. She kept coming, and she came and worshipped him, verse 25, and said, Lord, help me. And he answered her. He said, you know, it's not appropriate to take the children's bread and feed it to the dogs. And she got highly offended and left. Not what she did. She said, Lord, that's true. But you know, even the puppies under the table eat the crumbs that fall from the plate. That was her attitude. An attitude of humility and an attitude of absolute faith. And Jesus said unto her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you even as you will, as you will. and her daughter was made whole from that very hour. You know, Christ didn't come to perform great miracles and to work great works throughout all the, the, the Gentile areas. He was there uh, in a specific narrow area. But here was a woman that came to him and exemplified an attitude of humility and faith that her example is set down for every one of us. Pointed out. And he performed a miracle for her. Now contrast that was up earlier in the book of Matthew in chapter 15 when the scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus and they had a question. They said, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders and they don't wash their hands before they eat bread? Now, the Pharisees had concocted this great tradition that uh, had to do with ceremonial defilement. The issue is not uh, the fact that you, 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 know, you ought to eat with dirty hands. The issue wasn't uh, that they were soiled. The issue was that if you had been out in public, you may have brushed against a sinner. And if you touched bread and put it in your mouth, then you were defiled because those hands had been defiled by touching a sinner. You may have touched someone that was ceremonially defiled. And they had this great ritual rolling up and washing up to the elbows, and they had debates about whether you could use water only from a source of running water or whether you could use water from a, uh, you know, a pond. And they, they, they got into great debates over the subject of where the water came from and all sorts of things. And they noticed that Christ's disciples just simply picked up something and ate it. And they, were, they took exception to that. Jesus answered in verse 3, and he says, Why do you transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? They asked him, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition? He said, Well, I've got a question for you. Why do you transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? God commanded, Honor your father and your mother. That comes right out of the Ten Commandments. You say, Whoever shall say to his mother or father, It's a gift by whatever you may be profited by me, 
and honor not his father or mother, he shall be free. Thus, if you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draws near unto me with their mouth, and honors me with their lips, their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. It's possible to worship God in vain. You have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. They were worshiping Him by teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And He called the multitude and He said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goes into a man defiles a man, but that which comes out of a mouth, out of the mouth, that defiles a man. The issue if you take it in the context, it has nothing whatsoever to do with clean and unclean meats. It has to do with the subject of ceremonial defilement. And he said it's not the bread that you had your hands uh, ceremonially defiled. That'll just go in and go through the digestive system and come out uh, the other end. And uh, that's not going to defile you. But what will defile you is the things that come out of your mouth, that come out of your heart. The things which come out of a man, out of the mouth. This defiles a man. Verse 12, then came his disciples to him and said, you know what? I, I think the Pharisees were offended after they heard this thing. You know, I, I think you offended those guys. They laughed, and boy, they didn't look too happy. I, I think you offended them. You know, sometimes people are offended because of the truth. People will be offended of the truth if they don't have a love of the truth. The Pharisees were offended because they didn't have a love of the truth. Christ talked about in, in uh, uh, John 12, in verse 43, He talked about individuals. He says, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, these were some of the chief rulers who believed in Christ but were unwilling to stand up for the truth, verse 42, because of the Pharisees they did not confess Him lest they should be put out of the synagogues. If they stood up, the Pharisees would have kicked them out. And Christ said they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. You see, they didn't love the truth enough. You'll be offended by the truth if you don't love the truth more than your own way. These were individuals... The Pharisees were offended because of the truth, because they didn't love the truth. They loved their own way. And that's the normal, natural, carnal thing to love. You know, that's, that's humanly what we love. You find when Jesus came back to Nazareth uh, in his own country, Matthew 13, verses 54, on down through 58, people heard him speak and they said, where did he get off saying all of this? Verse 54, whence has this man wisdom in all these mighty works? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Why, we've known his father and mother, his brothers, his sisters. Why, they all live around here. Why, we've known him since he was knee high. Where does he get off coming in and doing this and saying that? And it says, verse 57, they were offended in him. They were offended by Christ because they were offended by the truth because of the messenger. They said, what? I don't see how he can come up with all this stuff. Well, I saw him grow up. I've known him for years. No all his family. They were offended. Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They were offended. Well, you can go through and you can read example after example. Psalm 119, verse 165 tells us, though, very important key. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Great peace. If you love the law of God, if you love the truth of God, there's a peace of mind that you have. You're not going to stumble and be offended because of the truth. Oh, the truth may hurt sometimes. Truth can hurt because, you know, the truth of God, the Word of God is sharp and powerful like a two-edged sword, and it'll pierce, it'll cut. If you read the Bible and never get your toes stepped on, then you're not reading it properly. Because if you really read and study the Bible, there are going to be some things that are going to hurt. There are going to be some things that are going to cut. You're going to see some things that point out changes you need to make in your life. All of us are. Oh, you can read through Scriptures and you can find examples of where a man of God came to, to a king or to a ruler and told him the truth. 
And the ruler was so upset, he had the, ma- he had the messenger executed or thrown in jail. He didn't love the truth. He loved his own way. He was offended because of the truth. Some will be offended because of the pressures. Because they're not deeply rooted and anchored and grounded in the truth and they're relying on their own strength and not on God. And they will stumble under pressure. Others will stumble because of the words and actions of other people. Either because they lack the humility and the faith to have the commitment regardless of what others are saying or doing, because they lack the ability or the willingness to forgive and to let go, because they lack the depth of commitment to God and to His way, the kind that Moses had that you read of in Hebrews 11, that even when all of the the enticements of sin, Moses didn't wander off the track there in Egypt. You can read it back in Hebrews 11. And when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, esteeming reproach for Christ, greater riches than all of the riches of Egypt. He was willing to take a stand. He didn't stumble because of people. Because he endured as seeing him who is invisible. His eyes were on God. We'll never stumble over people if we keep our eyes on God. We'll never stumble under pressure if we rely on God's strength. We'll never stumble because of people if we keep our eyes on God. And we'll never stumble because of the truth if we love the truth more than we love our own way. Now, brethren, none of us have to be in that category of those who stumble, of those who are offended. Many will be. But you and I don't have to be. We can rely on God's strength and God's help. We need to draw near to Him. We need to focus on our relationship with Him and walk with God. And therein, have the strength and the spiritual wherewithal to endure whatever may come. Ups and downs and all sorts of things that are going to come between now and the culmination of this age. But brethren, God's help and God's power is there for you and it's there for me. We've got to draw close to Him, and we've got to draw on that, and we've got to walk with Him. And if we walk with God, we will never stumble out of the way.